And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PrunerCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at PrunerMarketing.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of PrunerCast with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Indeed, indeed. This is another uh, one of your conversations that we've got this week, and very interesting topic. Um, I'll give you a little heads up, folks. It's uh, we're going to talk. Pete's been talking about negotiation uh, this week, and I'll give you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but it's it's a topic that. I've, I've been waiting for somebody to talk about for a while. I'll, I'll give you that much so far. Um, but uh, before we get into that, what's, uh, what's been happening this week, Pete? Oh, look, it's been a, a, a usual week in the preneur world, just sort of, uh, continuing my training for some Ironman sort of stuff and actually toying with doing a, uh, 40 mile run for a friend's 40th birthday in March, which will be interesting. So kind of just, thinking about doing that haven't committed yet but uh you know what's 40 miles about 60 60 kilometers in the in the australian language so that could be uh, a very interesting little kind of um attempt in march yeah if it was anybody else i'd probably say you need to look at who you're hanging out with if they want you to run 40 miles for their birthday <laughs> <laughs> yeah um a relatively new friend of mine i guess you call it um he's uh yeah very very fit uh, we're trying to be very, very fit, at least. And yeah, for his 40th, wants to run 40 miles. So looking for a few people to sort of either do parts of it or all of it with him. And I'm thinking might put my hand up to be um, his, uh, you know, second brain during the run. So, yeah, it could be interesting. Cool, cool. So you're, you're back on the the training for the Ironman again. Yep. Have you got a, a date in mind for that? Yeah, I, I got, I'm doing two half Ironmans. Uh, one, I think it's the last week of January, and then the other one's the first week of Feb. So a week apart, two halves. So, so it's that long old training regime again. It's all back on, and you know, it's daylight savings here in, in Australia now too, so it means it's a little bit lighter at night and uh, makes it easier to sort of, you know, get out and do stuff in the evening if I have to after Eli goes to bed. But other than that, just kind of, you know, just already starting to think about 2014, you know, getting close to the end of this year into the last quarter and uh, most of the stuff this year is kind of planned out. Now it's just about execution, which is, um, you know, funnily enough, probably the easy part if, if you do the planning right. Uh, so now it's just about sort of thinking through what's uh, 2014 look like, what are the big projects, what stuff are we not going to do, uh, what are we going to do that's new, what are we going to keep doing that's worked really, really well this year, and just kind of really, uh, you know, keep, keep the foot on the accelerator and, and move forward. Well, there's a whole bunch of topics that I think we could probably wrap up into a show on planning and, and forward thinking. Um, just to pull you back a little bit, because I know when you're doing your training, you are pretty much always listening to some form of of content usually yep. an audio book of one or another what's uh what, what's currently on the uh, on the old ipod or iphone at the moment oh, it's still um arnold schwarzenegger's total recall book I, I think as i mentioned i don't know if it was last episode or a couple episodes back that it's 23 that was a while ago 23 and a half hours long so you know it's a, it's a lot of runs um and obviously you know <laughs> you can't listen to a whole lot of stuff on the pool um, so I'm listening to that when, I'm re- when I've been running. Um, and on the bike, I've actually been listening to another Audible book, um, The Warren Buffett Way, um, an investing book. I, um, I, I tend to sort of try and have different books for different activities because the problem with writing um, is that I don't have, the, obviously, the headphones up as loud as I do when I'm running because obviously there's cars and traffic and, you know, safety is a much greater issue on the road than it is um, when I'm out running. So I kind of pick a book that I'm interested in but not sort of devoted to if that makes sense, because obviously, you know, yep. certain times, you know, I'll, I'll miss, you know, words occasionally if I'm doing a certain thing on the bike or there's, you know, lo- like lots of traffic around the area that I'm riding for that sort of three or four minute stint um, of the journey. So I sort of write, listen to a book that I'm not that engaged with or that sort of, yeah, as I said, devoted to. So the Warren Buffett Way is an interesting book, kind of just hearing about Warren Buffett's story and, and, and Berkshire Hathaway and obviously his investing um, you know, process and things like that. So I'm finding it intriguing, but it doesn't really bother me if I miss parts of the story. Whereas obviously with Arnie's book, I'm really, really engrossed by his journey from obviously, you know, growing up in, um, you know, the, the, you know, European sort of countries and stuff. He sort of moved around a little bit with his, um, bodybuilding and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, uh, he suddenly just appeared in, um, California, uh, is, is, in the book. He's actually now in, uh, in Cali working out in Gold's gym and just sort of starting his, uh, 
domination around the United States. It's, uh, it's been very cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I'm still shocked by the length of it, but it's it's keeping you engaged, which is which is a great testament yeah, to the book. Yes. Um, and I I do find that story another one of those examples of of an, what at the time may have appeared like an overnight success, but really took a really long time and a lot of hard work. Yeah, oh, and planned. Like now, you know, obviously with any book, you know how much of him writing now saying it was all planned and thought through like really how detailed was his plan you don't know i think you know it talks about you know very clear examples of, of things he did from a very very young age from 17 18 you know his goal was i want to get to america and i want to sort of make it big in america because um there was a, a huge bodybuilder at the time uh who had played tarzan i think it was in the movies and that was one of the very first movies that that arnie saw um growing up and it was like i want to do that uh in terms of be a big muscly bodybuilder and then obviously you know going to the movie so he basically really structured a lot of stuff um to get to that place and worked damn hard at it this is the thing that so many people don't really realize about arnie and obviously i think a lot of people probably be familiar with it given that you know he's had success in three or four different areas obviously you know politics movies uh business and obviously you know mr olympia and the bodybuilding stuff but he is one determined hard working son of a bitch like there's, you have to grant him that everything he's got has come from reps, whether it's, you know, obviously reps in the gym or, you know, chops while he's acting and all that sort of stuff. And obviously I haven't got to the, the real in-depth part of the acting and obviously you nowhere know, near the politics stuff yet. But just it's, it's really inspiring about how hard he actually worked to, uh, to get what he, what he wanted to do. Cool. He and and, and I like, think it's incredible. Yeah, I, I I do think I love those stories. I think that there's as much to be learned from reading about people like that who may seem completely related to to our businesses and things like that. Just just from a determination, a planning, a goals, a focus, you know, the hard yards as you you call it, all all that kind of stuff. It can be just as inspirational as helpful as reading about the strategies and tactics of business. Yeah, but this is the thing that I find really interesting is that a lot of people I talk to go, yeah, yeah, of course he worked hard, but he had, you know, the God-given talents to start with and things like that. And that's probably partly true, but you still have to work your butt off. And it's interesting, a correlation that kind of popped into my head um, recently was I was listening to a, uh, another podcast, um, uh, an interview with a comedian, an Australian comedian who's about to head off to, to New York to do, do a whole bunch of stuff. And... Um, Scott, the, the comedian get interviewed, was talking about him preparing for a recent um, comedy festival gig. He actually was obviously writing his, his, his comedy and trying to get his skits down and all that sort of stuff. He actually um, like kind of like sublet, I guess you call it, a desk in a friend's office and went there every day to write jokes. And that just, when I heard that, sounds so incongruent, like a comedian, like not that you write you know, your jokes and plan out your jokes. That's pretty obvious as a comedian. But he, during this preparation period for the comedy festival, he would get up, leave his house, go to an office, sit in a cubicle and write comedy every day. And that just really blew my mind about the, like, the dedication that, that, you know, even comedians need to display to be funny. And you kind of think that, you know, comedy and humour is an innate kind of ability and if you're funny you're just funny and you just sit there and you think uh, on your couch and you start writing in the back of a notebook and you come up with cool jokes but he was actually you know very very disciplined to the point of going into an office and sitting in an office to do his comedy so for people who are sort of trying to be entrepreneurs doing it on your kitchen table or your lounge room you know if a comedian goes to an office every day to be professional at his craft what should entrepreneurs be doing you know going to an office every day to be professional in your craft. And that was a very interesting kind of, I guess, similar kind of thing to, to what Arnie talks about quite a lot in, uh, in Total Recall. Cool, cool. Interesting. Well, I think that, I think we should uh, move on to your conversation for this week. And uh, I did, as I said at the beginning, it's a topic that fascinates me. Um, and <laughs> usually... Uh, Listeners, there's a little secret. If something fascinates me, it's usually because I suck at it. Um, and I'm a bit like Pete. I don't like being bad at things. Um, but this week, Pete, you were talking to Jenny Radcliffe, um, who is a very interesting specialist in the, in the art and science of negotiation. 
Yeah, she's um, got a, a, a quite a long resume in terms of uh, various different types of negotiation and, and training and consulting and things like that. And uh, it was a great little conversation about just different tactics that you need to think about when you're negotiating, you know, what your mindset should be, what are some of the things you should be doing, how do you actually read the other people that you're negotiating with. And that's kind of, I guess, where a lot of her, her skills and advice uh, is around is in terms of reading people and the micro nuances that, that the person does, that you can actually get a, a non-verbal understanding of what they're really trying to say or where they're really at in the negotiation sequence. And you can obviously use that to your own advantage. And it was a really cool conversation and uh, a lot of stuff to take notes on. And then obviously uh, some books and stuff that she recommended too, which if you're interested in this sort of stuff, highly, highly recommend you check them out because they're, they're fun, engaging and interesting reads. Yeah, definitely, folks. Listen out. I, it's, a, it's a fascinating conversation. Uh, but listen out. As Pete said, um, Jenny's got a perspectives and, and kind of a mindset about negotiation. And this is not your standard textbook sales negotiation type of stuff. This is real world, very practical, very applicable stuff. So even if you think you know, about negotiation, this is definitely worth a listen for a different perspective on stuff. So uh, with that said, get your get your pencils and paper out or just listen carefully in to this conversation with Pete and Jenny Radcliffe. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for joining the show. Really appreciate your time. Great to be here. Now, I know you are super busy consulting with uh, governments, corporations and everyone in between on negotiations. Can you sort of, I guess, give more of a formal kind of background of, of what you do and, and who you are? Sure. Um, so I'm Jenny Radcliffe um, and I'm a consultant and a trainer in a couple of different areas. Um, so originally I did uh, training in normal, if you like, business disciplines. So um, everything from, from project management to procurement stuff. But I ended up specialising in negotiation because I did a lot of work in Asia um, and other places, and I was terrible at languages. I just couldn't pick them up. So I used to watch um, body language and nonverbal communications. And from that, uh, I studied that and I became, um, I guess, an expert in nonverbal communications and particularly in deception. And, and so, in terms of what I do these days is I negotiate, I do a lot of persuasion and influence training um, and, and communications in terms of what people say and how credible it is, but also in the way people's faces and body language move and um, connected with those types of things as well. Everything about persuasion and influence techniques is applicable to every type of negotiation. So there's lots of types of negotiations, but in the same way a crisis negotiation um, requires a certain certain levers that you push, so um, or levers you guys call them. <laughs> I believe. Uh, the thing is, uh, everybody is motivated in certain ways, um, and what you have to do in any situation, so any kind of negotiation situation, is you have to leave your emotion to one side and try and look at things rationally. So you're looking to see what motivates this person and how we can achieve objectives for that person based on their motivation. So in the same way you'd look at anything else, you would look at what's this person trying to achieve, what does this person not want to happen. So on a basic level, everyone's motivated by pleasure and pain. So you're looking at what makes this person comfortable, what makes this person uncomfortable. How can we get movement? You're always looking for movement. You're looking for people to come towards a conclusion. Um, and really, as I say, in, in, a, in a crisis situation, the same as anything else, it's just those things. Things change from minute to minute, and there isn't a formula for uh, any type of negotiation. Although there are sort of rules in terms of the way people will act and behave, which if you follow those, means it's more likely that you'll get a good outcome. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Is there any of those sort of rules you can sort of share to give a bit of a more in-depth look at this? As I say, the, the, the sort of things that you're looking at is you're looking to take the emotional temperature of any situation down. So what you, what you don't want is people being led um, by emotions, whether that be anger or fear. You want people to see situations more, more rationally. 
And, and, and so there are a few things. If we talk about things like um, in, in a traditional negotiation, like a contract negotiation, a lot of the time you'd be looking for things like win, win. Mm. But in any negotiation, some of the training that, that we tend to give the guys is about, let, let's not look at that. Let's just look at what everyone's trying to achieve. Let's look at objectives. Because the minute you talk about things like win-win, you reduce it to a competition, to uh, the sports field. It's the language of the sports field. Mm. And you want to leave your ego behind. The thing is, people bring egos to negotiations, all types. And that ego needs to be left behind. And if you leave that ego behind, you'll see things more clearly in any situation and, and be able to, uh, you know, to, to, to come to a good outcome for everyone. But it's not necessarily a win-win. It's, yeah. it's, of course, win-win is better than win-lose. But I, I, I always teach people to just take that, take all of that away and just think, what are we trying to achieve? So you can choose to lose as long as you achieve what you set out to achieve. It doesn't really matter. So when you, so when you define <laughs> loss in that regard, you're saying a, the other person may get a, a better deal, but as long as you've got your, for whatever better term, minimum expectations or minimum requirements, that should be a, a positive outcome. Is that sort of a fair assessment of what you're saying or not? Yeah, that, that's fair enough. It's it's that type of thing. What you're looking to do is you're looking to achieve what you set out to achieve. And as long as you set yourself, you know, good targets, um, there's no reason why everyone else can't uh, win as well. Perhaps slightly different in a criminal situation. <laughs> um, but you know, if your target is that everyone gets out safe uh, and that type of thing, then that then that's a win, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. But the interesting thing is, do you ever, you know, discuss as part of your training the the emotional baggage that can come with a situation like that? Like in terms of like I've seen many times where someone's, you know, going to a negotiation with I would love this outcome, whatever it might be. Um oh. and you find out throughout the out the negotiation that you get that outcome, yet it appears by the way the conversation's gone or some other stuff they've said after the fact that you could have got a better deal or you felt like they still got the better deal even though you got your minimum expectations or minimum requirements. And you have this almost negotiator's remorse which seems to sort of come in as well after the fact like how do you deal with that as well because that's kind of i think an issue that people do have during the negotiation they say okay i've hit my minimum targets but this person's still getting a better deal like how do you keep that ego in check so you don't have that remorse after the fact oh you see this is you're touching on such a cool thing because this is so true what what happens is and can i just frame this in terms of contracts and business negotiations um what happens is so absolutely you go in and you achieve your expectations and then why do why do we not all why are we not always happy with that well there are two things the first thing is psychologically in a negotiation you don't feel like you've won unless you think the other guy has lost Mm. you're not happy or most people are not happy until they see a bit of pain on the other side right because it just doesn't feel like a win unless the other guy looks like they've lost and again it's the whole way that we frame that situation is is really um not productive but it's taught by numerous um, trainings and negotiation, it's taught by the media and by movies. You've not won unless someone loses. So that's the first thing. The first thing is you're not happy unless they're, they're experiencing pain. And pain can be, oh, you know, this guy drives a real hard bargain. Mm. If the other side is going, great, what a great deal, I'm really happy, there's something about I could have pushed him harder. So that's mm. the first thing. The second thing is if somebody feels that they've hit their minimum expectations but the, there was more on the table it usually means they've not done their homework because one of the, the most important thing about any negotiation is the preparation that goes up front you will accept uh, a, i give an example in training you know people will accept the list price for a house let's say a house let's just for ease make it a hundred thousand pounds or dollars and if someone comes in and gives you it, you should be happy, right? That's what the house is worth and that's yep. what you wanted. You've achieved your um, your goals. And especially if there's been a little bit of haggling around you that. You need that haggle. Work... <laughs> yeah, well, because negotiations are ritual. And if you don't yep. go through the ritual haggle, you, you've not played the game, you see. And so we're not happy. So let's assume that you've got a clever opponent and they let you work hard for it a little bit and you come out maybe with a bit more than it's worth, maybe 105 dollars thousand dollars and then you find out that actually they're going to invest twenty thousand 
convert it to flat and then have an annual income of say 200,000 or 75,000. Yep. In other words, with a bit of homework, you could have upped your minimum requirement anyway, because mm. now, now you know what it's really worth to them. So it's, it's a case of you need to know what you want, but you need to know what the deal is worth to the opposition. And, and there's a simple way of finding that out, which is to keep asking why. Mm. Why do they want to buy from me? Why do they want to buy from me right now? It's those, it's those simple investigative questions that will mean that you will get not just your minimum goal, but the maximum value available on the table. And if mm. you don't, you should feel, you should feel annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, should have that's, negotiator's remorse because you've not done your job. Yeah, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? You've got to like, be smart about asking the why as well, not just sort of be very blatant about it and sit there and go, why is that? And then they answer the question, then obviously, why is that? You need to sort of obviously, you know, I guess mix that into the conversation so you sort of come back to it and then you dip away and you come back to it again so it sort of feels more natural. Is that a fair kind of like take on how, how to actually make that happen? Yeah, the thing is, it's, it's you must you never, if this, and now we're talking about important negotiations, whatever's important to you, okay? But you should never try and negotiate on your feet. You should always have planned it, which includes planning good questions. Um, understanding what information you need from the other party and how you're going to get that information from them. Um, and, and, and that is not something that most people can do very easily without planning. Mm. You, you know, you need to say, I need to know why they want it. I need to know why they want it right now. I don't want to ask blatantly because they may not tell me, but sometimes they do. And sometimes it do, it, you just have to ask. Yep. And, you know, and the house example is based on a real example um, that happened to a friend of mine not long ago for the house um, that she was selling. And, you know, she's, if she'd have just asked why, the buyer would have said, well, we're, we're converting it. Mm. And that tiny piece of information that the buyer wasn't, um, didn't think was important would be a massive flag for me because you'd say, oh, well, hang on, that changes everything. And people tend to... Um, what they tend to do is when new information or surprising information is presented, what they don't do, and it's a, it's a little trick, but it's such a, it's such a clever thing. They don't just take a break and think about it. They keep going. So if I hear a surprise or information I didn't know, I say, right, I'm going to take, I'm just going to take a comfort break. We're going to take a few minutes just to absorb what you've just said. Mm. So mm -hmm. actually, you actually do try and break that conversation so you can actually absorb it and reevaluate and reassess and, and take stock of where you are right now and what you can do with that, that information. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, you, um, you might want to wait a little while if you don't want to flag to the other <laughs> side that, oh, my God, we didn't know this and this is important to me. You yeah. might want to hang there and just, you know, plan for it. And if you're in a team, you might want to have um, a yeah. signal, a nonverbal signal or something to yeah. say, look, let's kick under the table. You know, Kick under the table or, you know, <laughs> fake a, a seizure or something. But whatever that signal is, um, you, you, you say we need, we need, that's something new and we need to just reassess because it's a dynamic situation. So if you, you need a plan and you need your preparation, but you have to be prepared to flex as well. And that's the skill. That's what turns someone from being um, a good negotiator to being an excellent negotiator is that you, you change as the information changes and circumstances change. Flexibility, semper gumbo. Mm. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> that, that type of stuff comes from experience and you can't go and obviously negotiate a, a, a property purchase every single week to sort of get up to that experience or keep going back to your sole manufacturer every week and renegotiate the price of your widgets. Uh, but obviously, mm. a lot of that just comes with experience what are some ways to kind of fast track that is there any sort of good books you could recommend or or things people can do to actually kind of learn that habit because that is i think a, a really important habit to actually build up to be able to take stock reassess and, and and move forward but not doing it on your feet on the fly like you suggested well there's a few things i mean as a book i could recommend i could sit here and empty everyone's bank account through recommending <laughs> book after book after book. Seriously. Um, so there are some books I'd recommend in terms of negotiation. I'll, I'll perhaps do that in a minute. But in terms of in terms of being more attentive in the moment and being more um, or less likely to keep going and to sort of 
not take stock of a situation, there are a few things. I, I'm a very talkative person and I had to learn very early on to shut my mouth, right? <laughs> you have two ears and one mouth and it's the clue. The biggest mistake people make and the biggest thing that you can work on is to listen more than you talk. The person in control in a negotiation is mostly not the person speaking. It's the person mm. listening. And, and, it, and it's a, it sounds so simple, but it's so hard because we are desperate to get all the information out. We hear something, we've got an opinion on that, or we want to make a comment on that. And what I find is people just keep going and dig, dig holes for themselves. If the other person is, is quiet, people like to fill a gap. So we start talking and it, then it's not planned. And there's so much information comes out in that stream of consciousness when the conversation, the other person is just letting you talk, um, that it, it can be actually quite dangerous because you'll give away, that you'll show your deck, you'll show all the cards that you hold. So the first thing is, is to listen more than talk. And anyone who knows me well knows that for me that's the hardest skill I have to master but in a negotiation I, I talk a lot less than I speak so that's the first thing and the second thing is you have to try and master your emotions because negotiation tends to be uh, a pressured situation tends to have high stakes um, in terms of you know you're going to spend money or you're on deadlines or you're in front of your boss or you know for small businesses any investment that we make is, is a huge commitment um, mm. and so we get emotional people are, are emotionally driven and it's very easy for, for people who know what they're doing to, to say an emotional word and have somebody flick into an emotional state. Now, when you're in an emotional state, and, and you might hide it well, you know, you're not necessarily crying or, or red in the face or punching somebody, but you are actually suddenly you're focusing more on the emotion than your logical side. It's very difficult to really be reasonable. So what you have to try and do is master your emotion. Mm. So now, there are a couple of ways to do this. One of them is um, mindfulness meditation, which I know sounds crazy. And when it was first sort of um, put to me as something to do, I was, I'm like, I'm too busy for that. You know, I have, I have massive career commitments and family commitments. You know, I'm not going to sit down and just empty my mind. But it really helps you think more clearly and it really helps you not be so um, reactive to the situation, it helps you take a step back. And the other thing to do is to keep a diary of what makes you angry, sad, emotional. And when I say emotional, like I say, it, it, that's, a, that's a bad word in our culture, you know? People think I mean it like I'm going to hug a tree and knit my own music. <laughs> I don't mean it like that. I mean nothing less than having control of your mind so that you can observe other people more acutely. That is a skill. That's a Jedi skill. But you have to practice it. Now, those two things alone help you control that room. Mm. I want to actually delve into that sort of stuff from the other side of the, the, the table a little bit uh, in a moment. You talk quite a bit, I know, about reading uh, deception and reading other people's and their body language and trying to pick when they're emotional so obviously you can react. But before I go down that rabbit hole, I want to touch on something that you mentioned before about um, you know something that's important to you. When you're negotiating something that's, that's important to you. And I think you know one of the... I guess I wouldn't call it a truism definitely, but I'll call it a maxim that is in this negotiation space is this those who want at least wins, you know, that whole sort of traditional kind of argument that those who go into to a negotiation with the, the least amount to lose or the least desire for the outcome always tend to win. And, you know, which I think is true to a certain extent, but I'd love your take on this, Jenny, about how do you deal with that when you're going into a negotiation for something that you're really excited about? Maybe it's a contract negotiation of something that you're super excited about. Maybe it's a joint venture deal or a potential um, you know, client signing on or whatever it might be that you're really interested in that outcome. How do you not supplicate to them and how do you actually go in there with the right mindset but still have that control? Does that make sense at all? I kind of... Oh, no, no. It's true because if you, um, and I've made those mistakes, you know, in my own oh, everyone business. Everyone has. 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, over the years, you, you know, even even doing this for a living, because you think, oh God, this would be so cool. This would be the best thing ever. And yeah. it would, you know, it sort sort us out financially for a while. Yeah. I'd love to work with these guys. And the, and the answer is, it's it's the same answer as before. It's very boring, but it's preparation. Mm -hmm. You have to say. See, the thing is, when I prepare, I would say as a sort of down and dirty pointers for preparation would be, what is it that I want to get from this negotiation? And give myself sort of a, you know, a zone of agreement, you know, high and low figures and those types of things. Yeah. But you also always put yourself in the other party's shoes. There's a guy called Stuart Diamond, and he wrote a book called Getting More which is the book I'd a book I'd recommend for negotiation um, to, to get your guys up to, to speed on negotiation because it's very it's very nicely, easily written, but it's very strong concepts. Awesome. And he says, Stuart Diamond says, see the pictures in their heads. So if mm. I was this guy or if I was this lady, and what, why are they there? Because if they're talking to you, they're interested. Why are they there? And, how, and what would they want to see from me? And, and again, it's about that preparation. I mean, I was, I was being interviewed for, on another podcast a while ago, and I said, you know, if I was to, in a really high stakes negotiation, I try and spend at least double the time in preparation as I expect that negotiation to take. And if I think the negotiation is going to be less than half a day, then I automatically default to a day. So if it's two hours, I don't say four, I say a day. Mm. And, and the reaction that got was, you know, people were like, really? Really? What do you do for eight yeah. hours? <laughs> really? Yeah, really that much? Because if it's high stakes, if it's that important, it is worth your time. If you want to go in there and you want to ace it and you don't want to seem like a little puppy dog, you know, and someone's holding this little bone just, just out of your reach, you've got to be focus prepared and know where they're coming from so so what are you doing those eight hours you're spending six and a half in mindful meditation or are you actually like literally <laughs> looking looking on linkedin or are you what are you actually doing for that time because obviously a lot of the time you don't have no idea what the other person wants before you go into that meeting that's the reason you're having that discussion is to sort of have that investigation um come up as you sort of alluded to earlier so what what do you do in those in that time to sort of prepare yourself you see, the thing is, I would I would take uh, take issue with that. I think you do know you have some idea of what that uh, of what the opposition wants. Um, you, you always can make, and you have to make uh, informed assumptions. Mm -hmm. So there is some research, and I want to know everything about someone I'm going to negotiate with. I mean, I want to know, you know, what type of person are they? What, what's their background? What was their degree in? If did they do a degree in engineering or were they in a, or are they sales? You know, are they likely to be flamboyant or are they introverted? You know, I worked with lots of different people over the years and I always knew, you know, is this guy got an engineering background or a finance background? I mean, what is his attitude to risk? What are they likely to be like? And then you test those assumptions in, in the meeting. You know, you see if mm. you were right or wrong. And that's when the flexibility comes in. So w when I'm talking about that day before, I'd be looking at everything from the actual people I'm going to be negotiating with. Because you never negotiate with a company. You negotiate mm. with an individual. Yeah. And people forget that. People say, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to negotiate with, you know, giant corporations, the <laughs> No, you're negotiating with individual people, yeah. all of whom have emotional um, levers. See, I got it right. Nice. Um, <laughs> they have motivations for and against things. They have interests. They have fears. You're negotiating with individuals on behalf of a company. So I'm looking for as much information as I can get of who I'm opposite to try and pull as much out of that deal in terms of value for everyone that I can because the best negotiations is when you know not only do you achieve what you wanted to achieve but so do they and then there's more value added as well and you'll only do that by really doing your homework knowing what the marketplace is like that they're in you know what if you're buying a product or you're selling a product you know, where does that sit with them? Is that in their product life cycle? Is it something that they're very excited about because it's new technology and that's going to take their company forward if they develop it? Or is it something that they kind of left behind that's caused them problems? And then you look at the different ways that you can negotiate around those different situations. 
But if you don't know it at all, and you've not even tried to find out, and, and that's the point, you won't find out everything, but you shouldn't sit there at the end of the day and have lost money or value in the deal because you didn't make one mm. phone call or spend half an hour on, on the internet. A little bit of Facebook um, stalking and LinkedIn stalking. Well, you see, <laughs> it's important that, that you don't, you don't want to kick yourself because mm. you just did spend the time. And, I, and there's people I meet who say, well, you know, I never do preparation. I get great deals. That's true. And you also don't know what you ever missed. Mm. Maybe it was not. Maybe you're a natural. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this in terms of a, a practical question around that. Do you think it is better to do your homework and then ask questions so they'll answer and sort of, as you said, kind of reinforce homework you've done? Or do you show your cards a little bit and sort of sometimes, or, or if so, when, do you show the cards that you are that sort of prepared and you have done some, some stalking prior to the conversation? Is there, is there a time and place to show your cards or should you always just keep it close to your chest and get them to reinforce or articulate or, or prove that what your, your theory was is correct by asking questions? Well, there's no hard and fast rules mm. of that. I mean, you know, you don't want to come off like a stalker, <laughs> but you do want to show that you've done your homework, don't you? I mean, it, 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 that's going to depend on the situation. But in terms of do you do you show your cards, uh, sort of just to link it back to the question you said about what if you really want the deal? I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with going in and saying, do you know what, this deal is important to me. Mm. Um, I, I'm real excited about it. I'm going to try my best to make this work for everyone here. Because I just think it'll be a really good, you know, really positive relationship going forward. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's just you have, like you say, you don't want to be too eager. Um, and I think then, you know, you've got your information. You mostly, again, back to the preparation and knowing what you've got, you'll know the appropriate time to reveal what what you found out. But we're not going for creepy here. We're going for <laughs> informed and prepared. Yes, you, you know? don't want to walk into the big and say, oh, look, yeah, I, I saw you went to the baseball game on the weekend and yes. your, your son hit a, his first home run. You don't want to sort of go down that avenue to sort of break the ice. No, that's exactly what I would do if I was pulling um, a social engineering job, if I was being hired to psychologically test whether I could get past a company's defences. That's exactly the information I'd be looking for. And sometimes that information is, is, is scarily available on the net. People put a stupid amount of information on, on the web. But actually, um, no, I'm looking to say, look, I've done my homework. I know your position, um, or I can make some guesses. And, and you can say, you know, I, 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 you know, I believe this is the biggest um, real estate deal you guys have done this year. Am I right in that? Um, you know, you might be able to put things to them in a certain way that doesn't sound creepy, but lets them know you're in a powerful position in terms of data. Mm. That's okay. But again, not on your feet. You know, think about how you're going to do it. Definitely. The other thing about it is, is, is that strengthens your position is that you need to know what, and this is just standard negotiation stuff, but it, it's one of those things that gets forgotten, it is your, your alternative. So what are your alternatives if this deal doesn't work out? Then we call it a BATNA, which is a best alternative to negotiated agreement, which is if I can't talk with this team today to a solution, then what do I do? What's my alternative? You know, and if you know what that is, if you know your walk away position and you know what you'll do if you can't come to a conclusion, you're much stronger than if you're in there and this is, you know, last chance. Mm. The move. So, so those and, and also theirs. What's their best alternative? Sometimes when you analyze just that one thing, what will they do if they can't agree with me today? And what will I do if I can't agree with them today? That sometimes alters the perception of power in that conversation. Mm. Because suddenly you realize really what the stakes are like for either of you, you know? So if you've got a great big client, you really want to nail them, you know, and you want to make sure that you get that client and you're so excited about it. But then if you say, well, what's my alternative? What if this is a car crash and I just don't do the deal? Well, you know, I go after another huge corporate client and tomorrow is another day. Suddenly they're less scary and mm. you, you want it a little less because you can think, well, there are, all right, today doesn't work out, but I can, I'll just carry on tomorrow. I've done it before. Uh, so, so it's a very important thing to know what you'll do if it doesn't work. Yeah, I think something. it all comes back down to this whole preparation and being prepared. And I think that's such an important uh 
important thing to do. And it actually just reminded me of a um, a funny kind of quote that uh, a friend of mine, Osher Ginsberg, who's the actually the host of The Bachelor TV show here in Australia, he said to me, he learned this from a guy on a bus. And I'm sure this is the, <laughs> the place he's learned it. I remember that being such a really odd thing to, to, to find a, a, a nugget of wisdom. But it was the, the six Ps. Prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. Absolutely. And I, was, I thought it was just the greatest little <laughs> six Ps I've ever heard, and especially learning it from a guy on a bus. But um, I've, I've heard, I have heard of these um, these people on buses, or like you know, like a homeless guy, yeah. or something just dropping these these really great nuggets of information. I don't know. Um, someone said maybe they're angels or something. Yeah, so I, should, I should ride public transport more <laughs> often. But but on that note, let, let's actually t- turn the turn the the, um, the the conversation a little bit because I want to talk about deception because I know this is a, a big area of your skill set of sort of picking deception. And it's a, it's a shame we can't um, start turning the podcast into a video because we could start talking about, you know, reading body language and, and show some examples. But I'd love to sort of talk about, you know, reading people but when they're deceptive when they're emotional and how to actually deal with that because uh, i'd love to get your, your take at, at some point um as you discuss deception is when and if you call someone on something you've realized do you say well, hang on is that the truth are you, are you really mean that like, when is it right time to to call somebody out because i think that a lot of people in in, in a certain uh, innate ability to sort of have a bullshit meter, you know, and actually sort of, you know, say, oh, hang on, that's not quite right. Like, do you call people out on it or do you just leave up your, your sleeve and close to your chest? Like, again, it's probably going to be a situational thing, but what's your general take yeah. on, on that sort of stuff around deception? And then I'd love to hear some of your take on, on deception tricks and deception reading. Well, I mean, do you call someone? Are you right? It depends on the situation, doesn't it? I mean, I would, you know, it's. it's do I call my? Do I call the kids on it? Yes. Do I call Andrew, do I call Andrew on it? Yes. You know, don't lie to me. I know you're lying. But in in a in a business context, um, you wouldn't be so overt about it. But mm-hmm. but you would say, and in any sort of investigative interview, you would, you know, you'd say, um, just just go over that again for me. I'm I'm not sure. I understood it. You, you have to sort of it, lead people to talk more. The more people talk mm-hmm. around a lie, the more they will give away as a, as a general rule. Because what happens is this. When, when you lie, the cognitive load, so what your brain is having to do, is very heavy, right? So if you're just remembering the truth, you're just telling a truthful story, the only thing you do is tell the story as you remember it if there's no um real there's not a lot of effort in your brain Mm. but when you tell a lie and it depends on the lie so the higher the stakes the more important the lie is the more the more stress the more pressure um on, on your brain but what happens to most people is that um they're trying to be convincing in the way that they're telling the story they're trying to not tell you the truth so they're sort of processing, forget that, don't say that. They're focusing on a rehearsed story, which is the lie. They're trying to see if you believe them. So they're watching you quite closely. And actually that that sort of feeds into one of the biggest myths about lying, which is that people don't make eye contact. There's actually some evidence to suggest that people, a, a, an accomplished liar or, or a big lie, um, they'll hold your eye contact probably more because they're watching mm. to see if if they're believed is is one hypothesis but but they tend to really look you in the eye so what happens is all these processes are going on in the brain and it's kind of like having a computer with every application open and 10 websites open and a dvd in the background and it just does not it just takes up a lot of bandwidth to lie so what happens is that your fine motor skills become a little bit slower in a lot of people because you know it sort of knocks it out it's processing it's another thing so people tend to not do so much they sort of shut down a little bit and become a little bit less animated sometimes some people and i'll talk to you about why i'm saying that in a, in a minute but also um hesitations in the way they speak and what and really what you're looking for in their face is, is a lack of congruence between what their body language is telling you and what their voice is telling you um so, so there's there's a whole heap of ways that you can detect if someone is is potentially lying um 
Do you call them on it? Depends on the situation. I've been in front of people in my time and there's no way I would say you're you're lying. Um, but I still know that they are. Mm. No, as far as anyone can. Well, I think that the, the um, what you sort of alluded to earlier is asking, tell me more about that. Can you explain that? I find that interesting. It's sort of a way to sort of, I guess, flag it a little bit with them, but get them to continue to try and, uh, you know, elaborate on that little story and and that sort of will help sort of reinforce it to a certain extent as well i think and i think subtly too if you if you word it right uh, my take would be that a lot of people would sort of potentially realize that you're sort of half calling them on it anyway and that sort of is a it's a very subtle way of sort of calling them out without having to actually be very blatant and, and, and allow them to save face to a certain extent as well yeah i mean people are laughing no no problem um, uh, or, or less of a problem telling you sort of silly details. So if someone, if someone told the lie that they were trapped in, in a lift and you start say, well, what colour was the carpet? And that, this is what people do when they're trying to, in my workshops and things that I run, they're trying to ascertain a lie and they say things like, well, what colour was the carpet? Or how many buttons were there? Or, and, and people can tell you lies about trivia easily because yeah. you just remember the lift you've been in, you know. Um, it's it's more about how people. It's more again. It's back to emotions. It's how do how do you feel about that? Well, how did that make you feel? Were you scared? How did it feel when you were scared? And um, so so it, 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 it it's partly um, getting people to keep talking and keep telling you about this experience. A truthful person. Um, and, and the thing is, there's no hard and fast rules about this. Unfortunately, there's no one thing that gives everyone away as a liar. <laughs> there are just some things that happen often. Um, to most people when they lie but uh, if, if you were to say things like well you know keep going on that you know was this important to you and tell me more and the more that they talk and um, the more lies there are in there whereas a, whereas a truthful person will go well that's it yeah you know often because the fact you're not trying to convince anyone you go well that's it that's all i remember or i forget that now mm. whereas a liar might try and keep going that's the fight. you know so yeah, because because if you know you go well, I don't remember what colour the carpet was in the lift. I, I wasn't concentrating on that. I was scared because I was stuck or whatever. Yep. So so it's it's surprising things that give lies away sometimes. Mm. And, and what you're looking to do is, in a lot of situations, people eventually just admit it. It's because the relief to say, oh, well, actually that's not true, uh, sometimes is 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 very tempting when your brain is overloaded to the extent that you can overload someone by keeping them under pressure you know they just want it the, the truth wants to come out so it does a, it wants to see the light the biggest takeaway today is if you want to lie say very little <laughs> <laughs> but then that but you see this is the problem that's a big tell as well because it, uh, lack of detail is also a clue that it might not be true so there are a lot there are 19 criteria um, under one of the systems i use to show whether someone is credible or not. That's just one system, and that's within a story. And and although it doesn't it doesn't say this is a lie or this is the truth, it just adds up to a sort of almost like a, a probability score on either one. Okay. And and one and one of the and they contradict each other. So lack of detail could be lack of credibility, but too much detail could also be lack of credibility. It's to do with the way your memory works and the way the brain works. Yeah. We're making this very Ooh, hard. <laughs> <laughs> and the and I tell you what what the thing is the conclusion is is that with the right tools um, in terms of linguistic tools psychological tools um, and and nonverbal clues let alone some of the technology that's coming through at the moment it's very hard to lie and not be caught by the right lie catcher. Having said that, there are some people who are naturals, but mostly will get you. <laughs> so so let, let's start with this because this, you've, you've, you've opened a, a very big loop. Like I've got to at least start to close a little bit. This this system, this 19 criteria, can you talk around that a little bit? That would be it's, – it's intriguing sort of that there's a there's this system or, or criteria around this. Well, there's lots of different ones um, and they've been devised mostly by law enforcement over the years to try and test credibilities of various um, – of witnesses, for example, or, or – um, people who've been accused of something. Um, 
the, the one that I am referring to there is a system called uh, CBCA or Content Based Credibility Analysis, which was devised in the Netherlands by a guy whose name I can never pronounce, but I think it was Undush was his name. And it was linked to um, child witnesses who were retelling accounts of abuse. And, and one of the problems is, is that mem your memory is full of holes. Pete, right? Mm. You, you don't remember things well. People don't remember things very well. I do tricks on my courses to prove I'm, I implant false memories in people and have people seeing blue cars when it was a red van and all this type of thing. And your memory is all over the place. So what, the, what they were trying to do um, was establish whether or not what these witnesses were saying had happened or not um, and so they assessed some criteria and there's well, there's actually 21 of them but there's 19 main ones to see whether or not um, the truth was in there you know whether or not it was likely to be true and it's only likely to be true and there's lots of I mean I've given it now but like there's lots of um, different criteria but they almost seem to contradict each other but a lot of the time it's around feelings and, and emotion as well as details and also the way stories the way someone's account of something runs so if it runs very very smoothly does that mean it's rehearsed because often i wouldn't have rehearsed the truth why would i rehearse the truth mm. you know but, but if i'm a liar i would probably rehearse my story and then can the person move backwards and forwards through the timeline with ease so one way to catch people out sometimes some people some of the time such an academic argument that but is to say well you start at start at the end tell me the story backwards because mm. they won't a liar won't have rehearsed it backwards whereas if somebody typically anyway whereas somebody is telling me the truth probably just has to go probably can tell me it fairly easily because it happened you see so so deception lies are something that we all tell typically lots and lots of lies every day um, depending on how serious they are, usually depend usually dictates how easy they are to detect or how how much clues you give away. We call it leakage. Um, but bottom line is, um, most people are terrible. I mean, you said people have this BS detector. It's just not. It, it's not borne out by the data. Most research suggests that people are terrible, terrible at spotting a liar. Absolutely awful. Wow. Um, most people. Most people uh, are no better than chance, even law enforcement. Um, they believe all the myths of lies, like eye contact, that people break eye contact when they lie. There's no evidence to support that. Um, there's no evidence to support al almost everything that you believe about it. It, it just isn't proven in research. Um, and, and people are hopeless. There, there are two groups that, that were tested. Um, that were better than chance. Um, people who work for the Secret Service, so spies, effectively, mm. and the people who were the best at spotting lies were prisoners, criminals in high <laughs> in high security units. Oh wow! And they and they were the best people that the research so far has found at spotting a liar. There you go. So Neil Caffery in that uh, TV show where he uh, now works for the the uh, FBI oh. is a, is a perfect uh, perfect employee for the uh, Federal Bureau. We would, it would, the evidence would suggest that if it was real, then yes. So let me ask you, because one thing I love reading is, is books about subject matter that aren't in the business suit. And what I mean by that is sort of books about negotiation that are like, you know, a, you know, private detective handbook, for example, that had a spot a liar in these sort of scenarios and, and things like that. Are there any books around that, that that's worth checking out around sort of this sort of, CBCA framework that is not sort of too dry and dull, but is engaging for a business person to read and sort of then apply and think through that material in the business world? Um, most of the books about lying, certainly, are horribly academic and <laughs> difficult to read. There is one, I mean, I, I'm, I, I follow Paul Ekman's work, um, he was the guy who was the inspiration behind Lie to Me. Ah, okay, yes. So, so he, um, sort of the courses that, I, that I've sort of done on this, and, and I'm currently on a pilot MSC, which is the first ever MSC in deception being run in England, wow. is inspired by 
his work and others. Um, and, and his stuff's all about emotions, deception, and nonverbal signals. Quite heavy, though. Um, there's, a, there's a book that's a really nice guide to lie detection, which is called Spy the Lie. Um, and I forget who it's by now, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. But Spy the Lie is um, a nice, easy, workable guide. Um, and I'm just thinking for negotiation, it's, there, I mean, I suppose there's a blog called The Accidental Negotiator that's okay. very good. Awesome. Um, and in terms of, but I always think, I think, uh, Stuart Diamond's book Getting More is a good book because it, it's 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 anecdote based, so you know you can everybody can pull something from that. And that's a nice book. Um, but I'm just trying to think if there's anything that would be around CBCA and those types of things. Your best bet would be to start with something like Spy the Lie. And for me, I listen to it. Uh, I, I bought it on Audible. Nice type of thing. And I listen to it all because I, it's not that heavy, and I had to listen to it a few times. Obviously, I'm comparing it with some theoretical stuff that I already knew. Mm. So, so to listen to that, and that gives you sort of, I think that gives about 15 pointers towards deception, which are very good, if not as scientifically based, perhaps as the Ekman stuff, which is all um, very rigorously proven. <laughs> but the guys who wrote Spy the Lie were CIA. So, I mean, you know, you can't argue with that, really. <laughs> and no doubt, once you get into that book, I'm sure they, they reference other books in the, in the acknowledgements and things like that and sort of do the traditional reading, you know, dive in one and then just follow the rabbit hole as it grows. They do, but they say not – they talk about microfacial expressions, which is something Ekman proved um, that our emotions show in our face regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, personality. Well, Ekman proved it 40 years of research. No one has disproved it, although people are trying to all the time. And the guys in that book say, oh, well, that won't help you in a negotiation and it won't help you if you're trying to detect deception because it's so difficult to see an expression on someone's face that only lasts for a 25th of a second. And, I, and I'm, t I'm here to tell you that you can learn it very quickly um, and as long as you keep practicing, you can see what people feel. I mean, for me, the most interesting thing that I do is the fact that I can read what emotion you feel in your face. And and even though I won't know why you're experiencing it, because I've learned to read micro expressions, it's there. So that to me is the keys to the kingdom. That's what makes me a good negotiator. Um, because if someone feels contempt for something, I know that they felt contempt, mm. even if they're telling me that everything's fine, you know? you got to love it. We've been going for 50 minutes and you suddenly dropped the bomb about micro expressions. So we, we are coming up to the end of the show. Obviously, we don't try and no make this problem. go too long. But can you, can you touch on that a little bit? Because we can't leave people hanging with the, the keys to the kingdom and then uh, dangle it and take it away. Okay. So in a nutshell, <laughs> uh, Dr. Paul Ekman and others proved that there are seven – well, there's, there's academic debate here, but let me just for brevity say he proved it. There are seven universal emotions, which are disgust, fear, and sadness, contempt, anger, surprise, and happiness. All right? And underneath those titles, everything else that a person feels could pretty much go underneath one of those titles. So if you feel excitement, it probably go under happy mm -hmm. or maybe surprise, right? And what Ekman did was he went out to New Guinea and he took photographs of a tribe that had been isolated and asked them things like, if you saw a rotten carcass of an animal, what would your face look like? And they pull an expression for disgust. Now, everyone in the world pulls the same expression when they, when they experience disgust. So if you think right now of a food that you hate the taste of and what it smells like, your nose will wrinkle and your upper lip will go up. Everyone, li everyone listening right now is doing that in their car. Just doing I it. Guarantee. Just doing it right now, right? <laughs> That's why I said discuss rather than I'd say anger because we don't want everyone looking angry at each other while they're listening to your <laughs> lovely podcast, right? And what happens is everybody, and Ekman proved that even people who were congenitally blind, in fact, I think it might have been his colleague that did the research on this, Matsumoto, even people who'd never even seen a human face because they've been blind from birth, pull the same face, right? Mm. 
And you've got 43 muscles in your face and certain ones activate when the brain experiences one of these emotions. And it's only quickly, it's involuntary, it happens real quick, but it shows that that person felt that. Now, the job is for a negotiator is to link that expression to whatever caused it in terms of the language or the conversation because you're never truly in someone's head so you never actually know what caused it but you can make a really good guess and you can say bring the subject back again and see if it happens again but the bottom line is if someone pulls one of those seven they have experienced that emotion which means it is the closest that you're going to get really to know how someone really thinks and even to the point where you'll know it before they do often love it and, and you know just that <laughs> yeah, yeah easy just you know go to bed tonight wake up tomorrow you'll be all good so jenny thank you so much for taking the time to be on our show it has been very very intriguing i've taken a whole bunch of notes and the show notes as always will be on the website to the, the various books and stuff you recommended but for those who want to get in touch with you for either some more training or some personal advice what's the best way people can reach out and find you jenny okay so the best uh, way to find me we are currently rebranding everything and uh, www.jennyragliff.com should be up and running by the time this goes out so direct your lovely audience to that website and you can find out lots of stuff about me on there fantastic jenny well thank you so much for your time uh no doubt people will get a whole bunch of value out of this and uh we may have to get you back on the show based on the demand in the future ah anytime Pete. thanks a lot so there you go folks another great conversation between pete and in this case jenny radcliffe now pete uh I think you actually might have coined a phrase in there. Uh, it's one I've certainly not heard before. It, um, I've heard of, of uh, buyer's remorse, but you, you went on about negotiator's remorse. I thought that was quite a great perspective on things. Yeah, I guess it's something that it, it's kind of almost a buyer's remorse because I guess, you know, in a negotiation, you, you buy an outcome. Uh, in a in a weird sort of way, in a weird sense of the the term there, but yeah, it really is. You know, negotiated remorse. Negotiated remorse. I can't even say the word I made up. But you know, I think it's a, it's a real phenomenon that a lot of people have. Is that you know, you go into a negotiation, you walk away going, you know what? I don't feel like I got the 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 better end of the stick, or I could have got a uh, a better stick um, out of the, yeah. the the situation. I think it's a, it's a real big thing that isn't spoken about enough in negotiation. I don't think. Yeah, and that's what that's what I liked. You know, Jenny's perspective on that was how she, you know she she reframed that and reframed the situation because that idea of negotiated remorse that that, that basically somebody's lost. Somebody's traditionally, if somebody wins, somebody loses. Um, and and she talks about that and 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 the, the mindset of of just making sure people got what they wanted. No, it's not necessarily. It's not quite win-win it was a different perspective and i really like that i really like the way that jenny kind of framed those what what a lot of people have a traditional understanding of things like the you know the phrase win-win and so on um so i really found that that an interesting and and useful conversation although i'm still not convinced it's going to improve my negotiation skills (laughs) definitely something for me to work on and uh, put a bit of effort and reps into Going back to our uh, our initial conversation. Love it. So, folks, um, with that said, just want to remind you that uh, we have our regular competition uh, to win stuff from people that we've had conversations with. Uh, and you can always find that competition over at preneurmarketing.com forward slash win. Uh, competitions change depending on what we've got to give away, who's given us cool stuff, books and whatnot. So do pop back whenever you're listening to this recording. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're listening to it just as it's released or a year later. It doesn't matter. Just check over to preneurmarketing.com forward slash win and uh, see what there is and uh, enter the competition. Absolutely. Um, Right now, people who are listening right now, we've got a couple of copies of Ryan Holiday's fantastic book, Trust me, I'm lying. Confessions of a media manipulator. So, uh, you know, if you're listening right now, check that. If you're not listening um, when the show goes live, still head over to preneurmarketing.com forward slash win because, as Dom said, we'll have another contest giving away some other book or, or piece of awesomeness from a, uh, a guest or a community member or someone in between. Yep. And while you're over at Preneur Marketing, which is now the official home of Preneurcast, 
uh, we've consolidated all the episodes on topreneurmarketing.com. While you're over there, do drop us a comment. You can find all the shows, all the show notes, the links, the things that we talk about, full transcripts of the shows. Everything you need to know is over on preneurmarketing.com. You can also leave us a comment underneath any show. There's also that really cool audio comment feature. We love to get those, and we would love to feature you on the show if you leave us something via the audio comment feature um as always you can leave the comment on itunes and now you can also find us on soundcloud uh, and leave us a comment there so we really enjoy getting your feedback uh through those different means if you want to actually ask us a question make a suggestion for a show or just well just have a general chat really uh you can also reach us via email at support at preneurgroup.com just checking you're still there <laughs> support at preneurgroup.com um, and as anybody who has written to us will attest we personally reply to every email so please through one of those means drop us a line let us know about how you are finding the show the topics that we talk about if there's something that you'd like us to cover maybe it's one of those if I was a type uh, episodes that we do that you'd like us to do one for your particular industry or business whatever it might be do drop us a line we love to get your comments and so with that folks we will see you next week ciao you've been enjoying another fine episode of Prunercast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.prunermarketing.com or drop them a line via Prunercast at Prunergroup.com